What's up, everybody? This is um, Daniel for uh, Gets Out Talk. Welcome, welcome back. We have a special episode today. We have a Mr. Rick Lobello here from the zoo, El Paso Zoo. He's the education curator. Is That's the job title, correct? That's my title, right. Uh-huh. Cool, cool. And um, can you tell us a little about what you do? Well, I uh, oversee all of the education programs at the zoo, and of course, uh, since we've been closed now since uh, March, uh, most of what we're doing right now is uh, we're actually for education. It's all virtual. Uh, we've been doing uh, programs for a variety of different groups, including school groups, uh, uh, using uh, Microsoft Teams and Zoom and things like that. And uh, we've been showing live animals on behind the scene tours the same way. And... Uh, one of the things uh, your listeners might be interested in knowing is that everything we're doing right now like that is free. Normally, you would have to pay something. So uh, we're doing that, and then um, we are also uh, blogging five times a week, um, talking about our animals at the zoo, uh, animals and plants from our area where we live, you know, the animals that you find in the Franklin Mountains and the plants you find around El Paso. And then we've also been blogging about our conservation programs. So uh, yeah, I've we're a, a very of the small conservation team programs. staying busy. Yeah, we're a small team, but we've been staying very busy. Cool, cool. Yeah, I was reading some of the conservation programs that you guys have, and um, I was reading about the Chihuahuan Desert. And I don't know if you're still trying to have this go on, but I read something about you were trying to get uh, Mexico and the U.S. to agree to create a national park to protect parts of the Chihuahuan Desert. Yeah, well, that particular project I've been involved in even before I started working at the zoo. Uh, before I moved to El Paso, I worked in our national parks. And uh, before I got this job, I actually made a presentation uh, to a conference of zoo professionals here that the, was sponsored by the El Paso Zoo. And then when I came here, I brought a lot of my projects with me. And most recently, I attended a a transboundary conference on the Canadian border at the world's first international park where I met colleagues from around the world working on similar projects. But a lot of people in El Paso have never been to Big Bend National Park where I used to work. Uh, but if you ever do go there and you get to know the park, you'll see it's a very wonderful uh, spot to enjoy nature. Uh, but what most people don't know about the Big Bend National Park was that the original proposal called for it to be a U.S.-Mexico park. Uh, that has never happened uh, for a variety of different reasons, and I've been trying to promote that proposal ever since uh, I learned about it about 30-some years ago. Okay. And um, is it what? what's holding it back? What's the, what's the... Oh, well, can you just imagine? It's a, a, a conservation project on the border with Mexico. You know, we have a president who is celebrating 400 miles of wall between our two countries. Uh, the politics has, has always been the problem. Mm -hmm. uh, when I first started working in Big Bend National Park uh, in 1975, so I go back quite a few years, uh, the proposal had pretty well died. Uh, president Roosevelt died and kind of went with him. And for a number of years, people were trying to revive it. And then finally, in the 1980s, the governor of Coahuila, working with the president of Mexico, uh, helped to push for some major changes on the Mexican side. And so in 1992, and then again in 19, I think it was uh, uh, 2012 or so, Mexico did protect more of the lands on their side. But uh, the political climate has never been right. And I'm hoping that with a new administration and more interest in wanting to protect large landscapes, that eventually we'll have some kind of a agreement down in Big Bend for a, what we call a transboundary protected area. In Mexico, they don't have national parks. 
So calling it an international park is really not appropriate for Mexico, but calling it a transboundary conservation area is very appropriate. Oh, cool, cool. And um, it doesn't get frustrating trying to, um, it doesn't seem a little bleak on some of the conservation efforts. Oh, yeah. I mean, for for everyone who's not paying attention, I guess uh, you're probably better off because it is very depressing to be involved in so many different conservation uh, projects around the world, knowing that uh, we're actually losing the battle in many cases. Uh, so I just try to be positive every day. I try to continue to uh, get more people involved and hope for a better day in the future. But uh, I, I, I say this often uh, that, you know, we really need to get off the ball, get on the ball here, because if the world becomes unsafe for animals and plants, it's certainly not going to be safe for humans in the future. Yeah, exactly. Like, how do people think that we're going to survive if um, the environment isn't isn't able to support us? Right. So, uh, so that's one of the things we're trying to do at the zoo. You know, we have, you know, three, I would say three major goals at the zoo. Uh, one is uh, we're definitely giving the animals we have there the best possible care. We have an animal hospital. We have full-time veterinarians. Uh, the animals get all kinds of enrichment and annual checkups. I mean, it's unbelievable how the animals are being taken care of at the zoo. And as a result, many of them live way past the age that they would live in the wild. And then, of course, uh, we're actively involved in saving endangered species. Uh, we've actually had uh, two Asian wild horses, the last of the wild horses from uh, Asia. Uh, they're also called Przewalski's horses. And these animals actually went extinct in the wild in 1980. And one of the horses that was born right here in El Paso is scheduled to go over the ocean on an airplane to Russia for a reintroduction program to help bring back the species. So we're, we're playing like Noah's Ark in a way, trying to save endangered species. And then the third thing that's really important is we're trying to motivate people by them being inspired when they see these animals to get more involved and, and so if anybody's listening that wants to get more involved uh, just go to our blog and contact me and i'll be happy to work with you and helping you find ways that you can get more involved in your in your personal life and your day-to-day -day life yeah definitely um that's what i'm I guess most interested in how do we get um, people more interested in conservation and being more involved in these projects? Well, you know, the, the, the conservation messages at the zoo are in competition with every other message out there. No matter what it is, people are involved in just trying to survive this pandemic. People are involved in trying to feed their families. And then you get so, uh, you know, worked up every day. You want to relax when you get home. So how do you get people involved? Well, the way you get them involved is you have to connect, help them connect with nature. They, they have to really appreciate nature. If people don't appreciate it, they're not going to get involved. And I think a good example here in El Paso is the effort that went into saving the, the lost dog trail. Uh, the people who were hiking that trail, and taking their bikes and enjoying it you know when they found out it might be developed they just rose up and they started signing petitions and the next thing you know it's on the ballot and they 80 percent of the voters voted to protect the lost dog trail it's the same thing with anything uh, concerning our environment people just have to appreciate this nature that we are a part of and learn about how they can get involved and one of the things I've been trying to do, um, Daniel, is encourage people to, to take leadership roles in our community. And that's more easily said than done. So you mean I like city, to, city council yeah, roles? Uh, well, no, I'm talking about general everyday citizens like yourself. You know, people, anybody can be a leader and get involved. You just have to speak up and be knowledgeable and have a good plan. You know, uh, uh, El Paso has a leadership uh institute uh, where every year uh, they come to the zoo and, and I've spoken to them but even after I spoke to them they were all excited you know but then when they got home they just kind of like forgot I guess it's really hard and I think if we could just get more people 
involved in leadership positions, I think we could accomplish even more. Because since I've been at the zoo, I've discovered that a lot of people who come to that zoo really want to want they want to get involved, but there's not enough leaders helping them to get involved. And so that's a great opportunity for anyone that's listening to. If you have any kind of leadership skills or you need to know how to be a leader, you know, I'd be happy to help you get more involved here in El Paso. Oh, that's, that's cool, man. Thank, thanks for that. I'm sure there's someone listening out there that will want to jump so. on board on that. I, I kind of want to jump on board on that because I've been taking more of an interest in trying to do something more for the environment because every day yeah. you read something and it just kind of gets frustrating. Yeah, well, the very fact that you're doing a podcast, you know, if you want to do a lot more of these podcasts uh, on the environment, I can connect you to a lot of people you could talk to over the phone. Oh, yeah, definitely, man. That would be great. Um, yeah, I would love that. <laughs> and um, so I had some other questions. Um, so about the, the wolf reintroduction to the Chihuahuan Desert, how is that project going? Well, right now I'm working with an educator from the Austin Zoo, and I'm in communication with the, the former Texas Parks and Wildlife uh, director. His name was Andrew Sampson. I used to work with him when I was at Big Bend National Park. And the strategy we're taking right now is we're, we're trying to find a way to convince Texas Parks and Wildlife to at least do some kind of research study to see how it could be done in Texas. Because uh, for years, you know, Texas Parks and Wildlife has, has been very uh, hesitant about getting involved uh, because there are a lot of uh, large landowners in the former habitat of, uh, of the wolf in Texas and West Texas and the mountain desert region that uh, have livestock interest. And everybody knows if you try to wolves back in the wild uh, if they can't find something easy to eat and there's a cow sitting there they will kill livestock yeah and a lot of people make their living you know uh, raising livestock so to me uh, the easiest way to make a wolf reintroduction uh, work is to uh, do it in such a way where you identify areas of west texas that are wolf free zones and then areas where there's wolves are allowed to live like in, in national parks and, and state parks where you don't have the problem with uh, ranching going on in the parks. And uh, But the thing is, you got to get people to sit down and talk about how it could be done. And so far, that's never happened. Uh, the wolf went extinct in Texas in 1970. The last ones were killed. And there's never been a serious effort by the, the government to, to even look at a way to make it work. So uh, this uh, educator from the Austin Zoo and I are working on a, a new outreach to get more zoos and conservation groups to speak out. And so uh, that's where we're at. And the reason why I think things are better today than they were, say, uh, back in the 1990s when I was involved in forming the Mexican Wolf Coalition of Texas is because a lot of the land, land ownership uh, has changed. A lot of the people who own a lot of these big chunks of land that surround Big Bend National Park, they don't make their living off of livestock. Uh, they they made their living off of uh, fossil fuels, and they just bought a bunch of land and and just want they just want to own the land. And so the attitudes uh, are different today than they were 30 years ago. But again, as long as uh, people don't sit down and talk, it's it's not going to happen. So we're trying to encourage people to uh, sit down and talk about it. And it, we're trying to get more uh, people across Texas involved. There's no problem with supporting El Paso. If El Paso had its way, we'd have wolves back by now. Over 20,000 people in El Paso, for example, signed letters to Texas Parks and Wildlife asking them to support a program to help the wolf. But they have not responded in any way and so that's the sad story there but i don't give up on anything i get involved in that i believe in and uh, so i'm encouraged uh that maybe 2021 will be a better year oh man i hope so with the new um with the new election yeah and also with uh the nominee 
uh, I can't remember the lady's name, I'm sorry, but uh, she's the first Native American uh, ever to be nominated. She's a representative in New Mexico. I'm sorry, the name just slips my mind. Uh, but she uh, has been nominated to be the Secretary of the Interior, which is a very important role. And everybody knows how Native Americans think about the wildlife and the connection between humans and, and, and nature. So I'm hoping that maybe with her influence, that's going to help projects like this move along as well. Right. And in the last 20 years, do you think there's been like a slow trend for people to be more interested in conservation or do you think it's been the opposite? Well, I, I really don't, I, you know, I know that there's uh, surveys uh, that have been done and all the surveys I've been looking at over the past decades show that uh, the number of people interested in conservation has actually increased. Um, but, you know, the, the number one thing is, you know, we are continuing to develop so much of the land. Uh, we're only shooting ourselves in the foot by the way we uh, treat the earth. And so we really need to focus on sustainability, which basically means we need to focus on finding ways to live together on this planet where we are maintaining our quality of life for future generations. We're not using everything up. We're, we're conserving. And uh, that's one of the things that the zoo is trying to do is to urge people to think in that direction. We need to get off of fossil fuels. We need to uh, basically uh, protect more of the land. And when we do develop land, do it in such a way where we also leave space for the wildlife that lives there naturally. So, uh, you know, I'm hopeful that things are going to get better. But, uh, again, a lot of people just are sitting on the sidelines saying someone uh, – a lot more people need to be involved. And I'm hoping that that's going to make a difference in the future. I think more people are going to have to get involved once they realize how serious the situation is. Yeah, yeah, definitely, man. And especially when it starts impacting them personally. Yeah, and that's why the zoo is so important is, you know, we have this wonderful opportunity to uh, reach out to people. And so uh, we're looking forward to getting the zoo open again. And, uh, and then once we do, we're going to continue where we left off and trying to motivate people to uh, become informed and, and get involved. And when do you think the – is there any – any word on when the zoo might open again? Or you um, I, I can't imagine not opening this sometime this year. I just don't know. You know, I haven't seen a date, and I don't. I don't it's really being. It's above my pay grade to know the actual um, thoughts that are going into the plan. But I'm assuming that it has a lot to do with the the pandemic mm -hmm. and uh, people getting vaccinated and. But, uh, you know, I think El Paso is heading in the direction, at least I hope, that we're not going to have to worry about this so much in the near future. And I think it's a good idea that we haven't been open because uh, we have to keep our community safe. And keeping people home and wearing their mask is, is really important. Yeah, definitely, man. I mean, we need to get this under control so we can go back to normal. Yeah. Yeah, and I had another question. Um, how do people like surround themselves with nature, like in their own houses? How do they start integrating like the environment into their design? You mean you mean with their um, like landscaping? Their home, you mean? Yeah, like yeah, in their well, landscaping. Uh, I think I think um, uh, one of the ways that people can be more connected to nature is by landscaping at home with native plants. Now, it doesn't matter what kind of trees you plant in your yard and what kind of bushes as far as uh, a lot of animals like some birds are concerned. I mean, as long as they have shade and a place to build a nest, uh, they're going to be happy. Uh, but, you know, when it comes to promoting the overall Chihuahuan Desert Ecos uh, region that we live in, uh, native plants are definitely the way to go. There's a lot of insects and birds that that need uh, native plants uh, to survive they just can't 
feed on any kind of tree or bush. They, they need to have these natives uh, growing nearby. And so uh, I think the easiest way to get started is by landscaping with native plants. All right, and then plus you don't have to water as much with the native plants. I mean, they just grow naturally, right? Yeah. Yeah, the native plants um, definitely are going to save you a lot of money on your utility bills, not only in saving water, but also in creating shade around your house because your house is going to be cooler in the summer if you have more trees growing around you, and then you won't have to have the air conditioning on as much. Oh, yeah, that's def- that would definitely be a plus. And then yeah. I had another kind of an off-topic question. Um, I had heard some research about in the north that there was um, like fungal colonies that created connections between trees, and they formed like a network. And I was wondering if um, there was any research like that in the Chihuahuan Desert, like if there's any some sort of fungal connections underground there. I- I'm not sure if I understand your question. What are they finding about trees? Well, that um, they say in the north there's um a fungus like network. Oh, a fungus. Yeah, and it connects up uh, for miles, and it's just connecting tree to tree, and they're able to um transport nutrients and information through that network. And I was wondering uh, if there's anything in the Chihuahuan Desert similar. Well, I do know that the the trees. Uh that we have, you know, are very good about communicating with each other. You know, they, they, uh, you know, they know when the sun's up and they know when the sun's going down and that of course controls the, the amount of photosynthesis that's going on. So they're smarter than we think, but as far as a particular fungus, I'm not, I'm not aware of that particular fungus. I can tell you that, uh, as trees suffer from climate change, in other words, when they suffer from drought, uh, they're not able to produce the fluids underneath the bark that normally would be there to fight off uh, insects like bark beetles. And then when the bark beetles take over, you know, that pretty well kills the tree. But I'm not familiar with uh, any particular fungus uh, that you're talking about, Uh not here. Oh, okay, cool. And when with the bark beetles, is that, is that an issue in areas like such as Rio Doso? Oh, yeah. Bark beetles are a problem everywhere where you have trees, uh, in the western United States at least. Uh, I mean, I used to work in Yellowstone National Park and in Big Bend National Park and uh, in areas where the trees have uh, been killed by bark beetles. Uh, it looks pretty sad. And a lot of that uh, bark beetle infestation is caused uh, basically by the trees not getting enough water, not enough rainfall. Oh, man. And um, is there any way to, like, start these forests up again or try to... Well, yeah, well, the Forest Service and other organizations are constantly working on ways to, uh, you know, help plant more trees. And so, but... Even if you plant more trees, if your rainfall is not going to be stable, then a lot of those trees that were there naturally may not be able to come back. You know, I know in Big Bend National Park where I used to work, um, a lot of the trees, uh, pine trees, have died because of drought. And, And when you go look, you don't see very many of them coming back. So as climate change continues to impact the environment, uh, there are some things that uh, were growing, say, 50 years ago that may not may not grow back because of climate change because there's n- not, not enough water. And here in El Paso, our climate has changed pretty dramatically over the past uh, few decades. Our temperatures, our average temperatures have increased by almost five degrees. Oh, man. And I sure, certainly felt that myself this past year. I think a lot of people did in El Paso. Seems like summer didn't want to end. Yeah, definitely not, man. It's a <laughs> nice little rapise this winter. So we really need to get serious about climate change. And, you know, we talk about this uh, on one of our blog topics on the El Paso Zoo Conservation Education blog I told you about. And, uh, by the way, the address is elpasozoo.home.blog. And... 
uh, one of the things that uh, we do is try to encourage people to, you know, do things in their everyday life, uh, such as uh, trying to lower their carbon footprint, which is the amount of carbon in your life that you actually are contributing to putting into the atmosphere uh, by your actions, such as uh, just buying meat. Uh, we've pushed for meatless Mondays because uh, the cattle industry, the livestock industry, the beef industry contributes significantly to uh, the amount of carbon that's put into the atmosphere. And, you know, but that's a little thing. I mean, that's a big thing if everybody did it, you know. The, the bigger thing is we need policies. Uh, you know, if, if you got um, El Paso, let's say 800,000 800, people and only, a, you know, less than a thousand are actually doing things like that, it's not going to have a serious impact. But if if we have policies on things that we can do as a society, we can have a greater impact. And that's what the Paris uh, Agreement is all about. It's about all of the countries of the world coming together and doing major things like getting off of fossil fuels to lower our carbon footprint. So if you really wanted to tell someone what's the most important thing you could do to combat climate change, yes, there's a lot of things you can do every day in your life, but communicating to our elected representatives and pushing for laws uh, is going to have a greater impact in the long term than anything any one individual can do. And that's just by writing letters, writing emails, giving phone calls to them? Well, actually, um, emails and letters and phone calls used to work, and they still work. But in my opinion, if you really want to have an impact, you need to organize yourself with some of your friends, maybe get a group of a half a dozen or more people, and then actually make an appointment to go visit your representative. Because there's nothing like face-to-face -face contact nowadays. Mm -hmm. Of course, now we have to worry about the mask, so it's kind of probably hard to set up a face-to-face -face meeting. But in planning for the future, you know, there's nothing that can get your elected representatives' attention greater than you actually talking to them in person. And letters and, and emails can help to make that happen. But overall, I've I've discovered that letters and emails and phone calls do not have the impact as a personal visit does. So once this COVID thing uh, settles down and people start meeting with each other more in the future, that would be, in my opinion, the best strategy to get your elected officials involved. I mean, I, I write elected officials all the time. Half of them don't even respond to emails. I mean, I even called my Texas senator uh, last week and tried to leave a voicemail <laughs> and the, the mailbox was full which is not unusual when i called oh man uh, they something. don't even go so, through it yeah it's it's really hard i mean uh it's all about money too and so if you really want to um, have an influence the best way to do it i think is to talk to your friends and neighbors and organize an effort to physically go to a meeting and speak out as a group. Right. And do you think with um, like petition signatures and with also with um, some kind of... Yeah, well, pe yeah petition signatures uh, work. I mean, it worked with the uh, Lost Dog Trail, didn't it? Yeah, definitely. So you just got to keep trying. Yeah, and they had to do it twice, too. The first uh, petition was turned down, but then the second one, uh, we found out. I wasn't actually involved in leading all that. I just knew about it. Uh, the second one uh, actually forced it to be on the ballot. Oh, that's good. So I don't understand how the politics works. Yeah, and is there is there anything like else recently that um, that's on the policy like that's directly impacting us in El Paso? Such a less... uh, you know, as far as the environment is concerned. Yeah. Um, Nothing that I can put my finger on right now. and But there could be a lot of things if people would just organize. Yeah, definitely. And then um, what about, like, they say the Rio Grande. Like, how is, what do you know about the water situation? Well, I do know that um, the El Paso water 
department is actively involved in trying to make sure we don't run out of water. And uh, the, apparently the amount of water that we were getting from the Rio Grande has, has gone down. And so they're buying water rights outside of El Paso to pipe water into El Paso. And you probably have heard about how they're working on plans to uh, make drinking water out of wastewater. Oh, yeah. <laughs> including, including sewage. And they're not doing it now, but they're getting ready to do it. So uh, we do have uh, a water crisis around the world. I don't know if you would describe El Paso's situation as a water crisis, but it could become one someday if we're not on top of it. Yeah. And so that's what the El Paso Water Department's doing is they're trying to stay on top of it to make sure we always do have good drinking water here. But we still need to conserve water because it is a very valuable thing. Water is life. And, and it's all around the world this climate change is affecting water as well. And so uh, it's very possible that uh, someday you could actually have countries go to war over water. Man, that's, uh, that's kind of frightening to think about. Yeah, it is. Yeah, well, um, man, so this well, I is... Remember, just to give you an example, you know, Mexico provides so much water, uh, and I'm not sure what the actual agreement is between the United States and Mexico on water, uh, where the water comes together on the Rio Grande from the two countries. And apparently for years, and I'm not sure if it's been resolved or not, there was a dispute between um, Mexico and Texas on uh, water. And uh, I remember about 10 years ago uh, hearing someone tell me, well, when you talk about this international park with Mexico, you might as well forget it because Mexico's holding back on holding back the water they're supposed to be giving us. So as long as they're holding back the water, we're not going to do anything with them, you know. So that goes to show you the politics of water conservation can affect other types of conservation projects. And many people don't even think about that as being a problem, but it is. Water is an extremely valuable resource. And uh, it's more complicated than, than probably most people think, including us on this phone right now. Yeah, definitely. That sounds, I don't know, like you said, just complicated, and I don't even know where to begin with that. But um, Well, people just need to become informed, and they, get, they need to get involved. I mean, I'm telling you, I've been living in El Paso for like 20 years, and the number of people involved is like extremely low. I'm a member of, a diff of different conservation groups, and you go to these meetings, it's the same people. And a lot of them are older, and and there's not enough representation from the younger generations of El Paso in, in, in these groups. And I know that a lot of people care, but we have this problem with our country where people, too many people just think the government needs to do it, you know. Oh, yeah, I support it, but somebody, they need to do it. You know, who's they? Well, they is me and you. People just need to get off their rear ends and get involved. And if if they want the world to continue the way it is or if everything's going downhill, because just look at it. I mean, it's not just the environment, it's politics as well. Everything seems to be going downhill. And so if we're ever going to change, we have to, we have to collaborate with each other. We need to get to know each other. We need to speak out. We need to get involved. And so that's the thing that, that I try to do every day when it comes to the mission of the El Paso Zoo is to encourage people to speak out and get involved. And if more people would just do that, things would change a lot faster. Oh, yeah, man, that's a great message. And I think that's a great message to, to leave our listeners with. And thank you very much. And I hope, um, and I wish you luck on all your conservation efforts. And I hope people do, um, respond to you and try to get more involved in El Paso because I'm definitely going to try to get more involved, especially after this talk. Great. Well, let's set up a time to talk on the phone after this interview and I'll suggest some things you can do. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. That sounds awesome. Um, well, okay. thank you for all, you, for all your time and I hope you have a wonderful day. You too. Thanks for having me. Bye-bye. Goodbye. Bye -bye.